Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, for invitation. And uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to speak to all of you uh, this morning at Pittsburgh and uh, afternoon <laughs> in Tel Aviv. Uh, so I decided to start with some pictures of uh, Pittsburgh. So it's a city surrounded by three rivers, as you can see from the view from the Mount Washington. And the University of Pittsburgh is uh, known for its uh, tallest uh, educational building called Cathedral of Learning. So at the time it was built, it was the tallest educational building. Now it's just the tallest educational building in the Northern America. Uh, so my talk today is titled Carbon on a Tube Based Chemical Sensors Drug Delivery Systems. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is the uh, what we do in our group in terms of the uh, sensor application using single wall carbon nanotubes and the material that we make from graphene, which we call holygraphene. And uh, then uh, I will tell you some work that we do with uh, drug delivery uh, using multi walled nitrogen doped carbon nanotube caps. For all of those uh, three carbon nanomaterial systems, uh, we will decorate them with uh, uh, different metal nanoparticles. And we will also investigate uh, enzymatic degradation. Uh, those material can be enzymatically degradable and uh, what can we can do with uh, uh, those properties of those materials since they're enzymatically degradable. Uh, but let me start with this, uh, uh, just the overall pictures of allotropes of carbon. Uh, when I was in the, uh, in the high school, we were taught there is only two allotropes of carbon, uh, graphite and diamonds. But uh, since then, uh, as you know, there are many more uh, allotropes of carbon, and particularly uh, zero-dimensional fullerenes and one-dimensional uh, single-wall carbon nanotubes and two-dimensional graphene, which uh, came uh, later. And all these uh, new uh, ty types of carbon can be visualized uh, relating to the just single sheet of graphite or graphene. And uh, they could be uh, related to each other where like, we can take the fullerens and basically by taking uh, certain parts of the graphene and fold it into the soccer shape uh, ball, we can get fullerens or we can just uh, roll up the sheet of graphene, we can get single wall carbon on the tubes. And of course, uh, multiple sheets of graphene stack up together form graphite. Uh, so the, the discovery of uh, carbon fullerens was uh, recognized uh, by Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996, given to uh, professors uh, Robert Curl, Sir Harold Crota, and uh, Richard Smalley. And uh, when I was, uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow at the UCLA with Fraser Stoddard uh, back in, in 2000. Uh, Rick Smalley is actually came to UCLA to give a lecture. And most of his lecture was actually not about the fuller ends, but about the carbon nanotubes. That was the new kind of new coming material back in the 90s, uh, which uh, Rick Smalley was working on. But at the end of the lecture, uh, we came out to the professor Smalley with uh, soccer balls and ask him to sign it <laughs> for us because uh, he was famous for the fuller ends and signing the soccer balls is like a famous uh, soccer player. He was very uh, uh, nice to, to sign us these soccer balls for all the students. Uh, so speaking of the carbon nanotubes, unfortunately uh, carbon nanotubes since, the, since their discovery in the 1990s uh, by Sumi Ojima who observed them in the uh, in the transmission electron microscopy. But actually before that, there was a lot of theoretical work done uh, to explain the, what we should expect in terms of the uh, electronic properties of the carbon nanotubes. Uh, so this is a description of the single wall carbon nanotubes uh, taken from the Millard uh, Dressel House work. And uh, as you can see, uh, you can take the graphene sheet and depending on how you're rolling it up, you can end up with different types of nanotubes. If you follow this blue vector, you're gonna get the zigzag nanotubes. Uh, if you follow this red vector, you're gonna get the, what we call armchair nanotubes. And connecting at any point in the graphene sheet gonna give you this uh, chiral type of nanotubes. And nanotubes can be described by all those indices, 
that's depending how many unit vectors you following one way uh, versus the another way. And uh, if you look at the uh, electronic properties, if the those unit vectors N and M equal to each other, you're going to get the metallic nanotubes. If it, the difference between them is divisible by three, you can also get metallic nanotubes. But if it's not divisible by three, you're going to get semiconducting. And roughly one third of nanotubes could be metallic and two thirds are semiconducting. So unfortunately, no Nobel Prize was given to for the for carbon nanotubes yet. And uh, I think Mildred uh, Dresselhaus, who done so much work uh, for the carbon nanosciences, uh, she unfortunately already passed away. So she will definitely will not be recipient when that prize is given. Uh, so Rick Smalley and uh, Bruce Weissman uh, at the time and uh, published article in Science 2002 where they showed that the these optical properties of carbon nanotubes can be also used for the fluorescence. So if you excite carbon nanotubes in the visible part of the spectra between these uh, uh, so-called one hole singularities, uh, uh, you can then expect the emission in the near infrared and those uh, fluorescence signals will be unique for each type of the nanotube. So you can see now uh, each uh, variety of nanotubes as indicated by, so, by those indices can be viewed as individual peaks uh, on this uh, excitation emission uh, map. And uh, a lot of things uh, happened since uh, 2002. So these days, uh, this is the article from 2016, at least they, they know how to separate each nanotube depending on its type by wrapping them these the DNA molecules. And now you can see that indeed they have different optical properties and they have different colors. So the it's, carbon nanotubes is not longer just uh, black powder. They have uh, very nice colors when they separate it into individual uh, components. And uh, commercially speaking, these days you can buy ultra high purity semiconducting nanotubes uh, from the companies. And that's what we use for fabrication of our sensors. So the first type of sensors that we make is just the conductivity-based sensors, where the networks of nanotubes is uh, being deposited on the silicon surface between the gold electrodes. And the measuring electrical current uh, through the network of the nanotubes uh, can be used as the way to detect the presence of any analytes that can bind to the surface of the nanotubes. Uh, so the nanotubes uh, that we fabricate in uh, our lab we put on the uh, silicon chips that just two by two millimeter size that we make on the four inch wafers. And after we dice the wafer, we're gonna end up with uh, thousands of those chips. If you zoom in on the, this chip, you can see that we have the interdigitated gold electrodes. And if you zoom in closer, you can see the uh, university logo, PIT, uh, which we just put uh, for quality assurance. So if you have all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted, you know that all the electrodes are printed correctly. And if you zoom in closer between the fingers of the gold electrodes, that's where the nanotubes. And in this case, you see the nanotubes are being decorated with gold nanoparticles. And you see the gold nanoparticles bind directly to the carbon nanotubes. Uh, and uh, then uh, we can test these uh, sensors chips, uh, deliver different gases create uh, custom uh, gas mixtures, control temperature and humidity, and in a truly parallel fashion, test uh, as many devices uh, and collect a lot of uh, sensor data. Uh, so the, in terms of the application, uh, one of the particular applications that we were interested for many years is the detection of the uh, breath components in uh, uh, as the trying to get the diagnostic uh, value uh, and uh, make the, get information about certain diseases. So as you can see here in the table, there are certain uh, chemicals that uh, appear in human breast that can be related to certain uh, uh, conditions. And I, at the time I, I had uh, a postdoc from Israel, uh, Uri Green. Uh, so Uri said that uh, we need to call it breathe, don't bleed uh, as the way to detecting uh, all the components in breast as opposed to uh, getting the same information from the blood samples. So over the uh, last 15 years or so, uh, we published uh, 
all these articles, which is related to the detection of all those these varieties of analytes in human breast. Uh, but today I'm gonna just focus on the last one, uh, which is uh, detection of uh, tetrahedral uh, uh, cannabinol or THC. So you may be familiar with uh, cannabis uh, or uh, depending on what part of the world you're coming from, it has different names. Some, in some places it's called marijuana, in some places it's called hashish. And people were using it for uh, thousands of years. And the reason, uh, uh, because uh, this plant contains this uh, very potent psychoactive agent or Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or uh, THC. And uh, the problem with THC, because it's a psychoactive agent, it uh, impairs the uh, ability of people to drive cars and it necessitates the need for the uh, uh, law enforcement to do the field sobriety test. Uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, convenient way to administer this test on the side of the road. And uh, the same the way that uh, it's done currently with alcohol testers or uh, breathalyzers for alcohol. And, uh, but the cannabis becomes increasingly uh, legalized all over the world. And in the United States, there are already 15 states that uh, legalized uh, cannabis for the uh, recreational use. And uh, still 36 states uh, where it's legal only for medical use. Uh, as far as I can tell from this map, Israel is actually legalized uh, marijuana for medical use only. Uh, but, uh, and that's uh, represent the issue because since it's uh, kind of partially legal or legal under certain conditions, you need to not just be able to detect uh, presence of THC, but you also need to be uh, very accurate with those measurements. And the gold standard for the detection of THC is the lab-based test using the chromatography with mass spectrometry, which is done with the blood samples. But uh, the thing is with uh, THC molecule, it's really a lep lepophilic molecule which stays in the body for a very long time and it's going to show up in blood up to three weeks. In urine, it cannot show up after one month. So the only reliable test is becomes the breath where the THC is going to peak after the uh, just 30 minutes after the use and going to stay only up to three hours. So that's the test that uh, we need to pursue. So in my group, uh, we developed the uh, breathalyzer for uh, detection of THC. So the, this is the chip that I showed you earlier with the carbon and tubes uh, between the interjugated gold electrodes. And uh, THC was administered by uh, flowing the uh, gas and through the bubbler, which filled with the THC solution and ethanol. And it's gonna carry the THC molecules to the surface of the chip. And you can see there is a selectivity. We can detect THC and not other similar molecules. Uh, so the, the actual uh, detection uh, can be done on multiple uh, uh, chips and multiple devices. So we can get the statistical type of information and see the differences uh, between the just uh, bubbling ethanol, which you can see as the blue uh, data points and the red data points will represent the THC containing uh, uh, gas delivered to the sensor chips. And at the high concentration of THC, there's no uh, need to do any advanced uh, uh, machine learning techniques to being able to distinguish between these two because they're quite clear there's a difference. But as you go to lower and lower concentration of THC, that's where the machine learning algorithm becomes very useful in terms of the uh, uh, predicting the presence of THC at the higher uh, uh, accuracy. So once we made the, this actual sensor chip that can detect THC, uh, we wanted to, to build the actual breathalyzer. Uh, the first uh, variation of breathalyzer that we built uh, was done in collaboration with the uh, engineers. So who used the 3D printing to build the actual breathalyzer. Uh, and uh, the electronics, which was based mostly on the commercially available Arduino Uno board and the uh, carbon and tube uh, sensor was just put as the part of the voltage divider. And then we can actually measure the voltage across that voltage divider and present it as the, in terms of the concentrations of THC. Uh, but when we uh, published that, uh, we got a lot of publicity for, the, for developing this uh, 
THC breathalyzer. And this is my collaborator, Erin Sadich, uh, who uh, helped us with the machine learning part and building the prototype. And my graduate student, uh, uh, Sean, who, 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 who developed that uh, sensor in the lab. But as you can see, the, the breathalyzer is it's a little bit bulky. You wouldn't put it in the pocket. Uh, so the, the newer uh, version that we uh, just published uh, this year uh, was designed with custom-made electronics, which uh, was uh, uh, in order to defeat the smaller uh, breathalyzer. And, uh, and that one, it actually allows us to put uh, multiple sensors. So potentially in the future, we can detect not just THC, but all other components that I showed you in the table can be also detected uh, using this uh, breathalyzer. So here's the comparison side by side between the, uh, the older prototype and the newer prototype. So you see this one, it can truly fit into a pocket. Uh, so in addition to just measuring the carbon chips as a chemical resistors, uh, we can uh, use them as a field effect transistors where we're just adding an additional electrode, which can be used as a reference electrode and measure the uh, uh, source drain current across the carbon chips as a function, function of applied gate voltage uh, to create this uh, field effect transistor transfer characteristics. So you see we can uh, sweep the voltages between uh, 0 0.6 volts to up plus 0 0.6 volts and the conductance through this between source and drain are going to be uh, dependent on that applied voltage. So if you uh, just measure it in water you're going to get one curve. If you're adding the sample the curve is going to shift and uh, we can then extract multiple uh, characteristics uh, depending what way the, the curve shifts or tilts. And those characteristics can be used uh, to, to predict the sensing mechanism. But also, if you use the machine learning, all those characteristics can be used as the, as the way for us to, to learn uh, about the sensor uh, performance. So my graduate student, Long, is actually used that approach when he functionalized the carbon nanotubes uh, with different uh, uh, metal nanoparticles. Some of them were functionalized with gold. Some of them were functionalized with platinum, palladium, uh, rhodium, and so on. Some of them were left bare. And because of that, they responded somewhat differently to the same analyte. And the difference in their response can be used as the data points to create these uh, uh, machine learning, uh, apply machine learning algorithms to distinguish uh, between different analytes. So what you see here, uh, he took this uh, purine derivatives, adenine, guanine, xanthine, uric acid, and caffeine, and they're actually similar, but uh, the, the response that being produced from different uh, elements of this uh, sensor array was enough for us that uh, linear discriminant analysis can actually tell those uh, molecules apart and uh, show the discrimination. Uh, in, in terms of the practical application, he, well, since the, he can identify the caffeine using this uh, uh, so-called artificial tongue or the sensor ray, he basically scanned through different uh, uh, Coca-Cola products and could classify them as being caffeinated and caffeine-free. Uh, but uh, the measurement in the liquids is actually represents its own challenge. We cannot longer use the setup that I showed you in the previous slides, where you're just flowing the different gases and mixing them and applying them to, to, to the sensors. We need to somehow to deliver liquid. So currently in the lab, we're building this high throughput testing, which would allow us to test the uh, sensors uh, for the liquid samples. So we combine the, these uh, sensor chips that can be loaded. You see up to 12 sensor chips can be put on this uh, custom uh, printed circuit board and connected to electronic equipment. But now it's a part of this pipette robot where the pipette robot can just basically bring the solution. Uh, we can take the measurement from individual sensors and then the solution can be removed. Another solution can be applied and so on, on in truly uh, automatic fashion. Uh, so we, we have a lot of uh, sensor projects going on in my lab, uh, but I, I would like to focus just on one because uh, we all uh, were suffering for the, for the last year or so from the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, when it comes to the uh, testing, uh, there's a lot of uh, need for being able to 
identify the presence of the coronavirus uh, because uh, a lot of people just uh, carry that virus uh, asymptomatically and can, can uh, contribute to the spread of the virus. And uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 testing, there is this uh, uh, gold standard, which is nucleic acid amplification test or NAD, which can be uh, done uh, using PCR at high, this high sensitivity, but it's a rather complex procedure and takes usually a long time. Uh, the other test, type of test, we we'll call antigen test, uh, that's where the people test for the viral proteins and that's cheap and it can be mass produced, but it has low sensitivity. So when we decided to apply carbon on tube sensors, we decided to, to use it for uh, detection of antigens. Uh, so my graduate student went in, she actually just uh, functionalized the surface of carbon nanotubes uh, with the uh, virus uh, protein specific antibodies. Uh, so there are two types of uh, antigens we were interested in. Uh, one is the spike protein S and one is the nuclear capsid protein N. So in order to detect the S protein, she functionalized the surface of nanotubes with uh, S antibody. And to detect nuclear capsid protein, she functionalized it with uh, an antibody. And uh, here's the result, uh, which not just show you the uh, selectivity, because basically the nanotubes they created with the right type of antibody were only selective for the right type of antigen. Uh, but also, if you look at the concentrations that we were testing, it's uh, sub uh, femtogram per milliliter. So at the time when we published this article at the beginning of this year, it was a uh, order of magnitude uh, better than any other reported sensors today. So the carbon nanotubes, which is 100,000 times smaller than human hair, uh, and in this case, we use this uh, semiconductor enriched nanotubes, uh, can provide you with this uh, unique, uh, not just selectivity because of the attaching antibodies, but also sensitivity. And overall, the whole test can be accomplished in the less than five minutes. So we partner with, uh, uh, our collaborators at the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center, UPMC, Dr. Michael Shurin and Sarah Wheeler, who actually were testing the, a lot of patients uh, for COVID-19 uh, using this uh, nucleic acid amplification test, which is the gold standard. And we brought our equipment there and uh, we were able to, with the, our test, uh, basically verify that we have like 80% uh, uh, or better uh, uh, detection of the of the positive samples versus the negative samples. So there is a lot of uh, examples that I can show you with the detection using carbon nanotubes, but I would like to switch gears now and show you how we can apply actually graphene for the detection of uh, uh, chemicals. So the graphene, uh, it's a two-dimensional uh, object compared to the uh, single wall carbon nanotubes. Uh, but uh, living in Pittsburgh, where we have hundreds of bridges, uh, I can tell you if there is this uh, traffic uh, stack on the bridge, it basically uh, affects the whole traffic through all the city. And that's true with the analytes binding to the network of the nanotubes, because uh, just the molecule binding somewhere on the network is going to just uh, create a choke point and affect the whole conductivity through the network of the nanotubes. Whereas the graphene, being two dimensional material, uh, you know, the binding could be, have the less of the effect. So we came up with the idea that we can basically uh, create this holy graphene or perforated graphene where we can intentionally uh, produce holes and in the graphene. And once the holes produced, what you left with this uh, interconnected network of the graphene nanoribbons, which can function the same way as the network of the carbon nanotubes. So we filed uh, for the, our ideas and for the first uh, holographene and we actually got a patent. And that truly tells you who was the first <laughs> for the, developing the new material is the ability to get the patent for that. So we have the holographene. And uh, uh, more recently, my graduate student, David White, was actually making more controllable uh, way to produce holes inside the graphene. Uh, using this uh, covalent organic framework that uh, we used following the work of William Dichtel from uh, Northwestern University, who basically showed that you can grow the covalent organic framework directly on the surface of uh, graphene. 
And covalent organic framework has this uh, pore size of 2.7 nanometers. So then uh, if we use it as a kind of mask for reactive ion etching of the graphene, we're gonna end up with the holes, which will be not just equally spaced, but also have the controlled size of the holes. Uh, so those holes then can be filled with gold nanoparticles and that allows us to, to weigh to, to control the size of the nanoparticles depending on the uh, template of the holes that we created in the graphene. So here's the verification using atomic force microscopy. As you can see, the, the gold nanoparticles that grow inside those holes etched inside the graphene it actually have the size of 3.27 nanometers, uh, which is uh, quite similar to what we expected from the covalent organic framework when we use it as a template to make the holes in the graphene. Uh, having uh, metal ability to put metal nanoparticles in the holy graphene gives us ability to, uh, to, to produce different types of sensors. So for example, the gold nanoparticles uh, are known to, to interact with the sulfur compounds. For example, if you use H2S or any other mercaptal compounds, they, they're gonna bind to the surface of the gold and, uh, and that's gonna change the electrical conductance through the uh, holy graphene sheet. And basically the sensor, as you can see, can detect uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide at the parts per billion concentrations, which is quite impressive. Or, you know, it's a similar to what you can accomplish with carbon nanotubes. Uh, and if instead of gold nanoparticles, you grow palladium nanoparticles, you can detect hydrogen gas and uh, it's parts per million concentration, which is also on par with what one can get with carbon nanotubes. So not just carbon nanotubes, but also holy graphene allows us to, to make uh, uh, good sensors uh, by aging hole inside the graphene. Uh, more recently, we showed that uh, you don't have to start with the CVD grown graphene to, to make the holes and make the devices. You can actually start with the HOPG a highly oriented uh, paralytic graphite, which has multiple layers, can be patterned exactly the same way. And just as we grow the cough and etch through, we not just etching through the top layer of a uh, graphite, but uh, multiple layers underneath. And that allows us to create many uh, uh, copies after the exfoliation of those uh, polygraphene. And again, they can be then decorated with metal nanoparticles quite reliably to, to form this uh, uh, to form these uh, materials that contain metal nanoparticles with the, uh, with the graphene. And uh, it's not just gold. We also show that it can work with silver nanoparticles, copper, and nickel. And uh, the, the nanoparticles, at least what we showed for gold, uh, uh, they, they can grow exactly inside in the openings of the, of the graphene. And the growth uh, happens such that the nanoparticles prefer to, to stay inside the graphene, actually as an embedded form, as opposed to just uh, attaching somewhere on the surface. And that uh, can be understood because the nanoparticles that way maximize the interactions between the edges of the graphene, which uh, populated with the oxygen functional groups. And uh, the, the exact mechanism how the uh, metal nanoparticles nucleate and grow inside the uh, graphene, uh, it's, uh, it's understood that uh, some of those uh, functionality, for example, phenol groups can be oxidized uh, to keto groups and that uh, oxidation at the same time can reduce the gold salt into the gold metal. But it's not just for sensing because uh, as we showed uh, when we decorated the uh, this polygraphene with nickel, uh, we can uh, uh, then use these materials as the catalyst for oxygen re evolution reaction. So there definitely could be used for these materials in the uh, electrocatalysis. Okay, uh, so let me switch gears again and talk about more about beyond sensing with the carbon nanotubes or graph, polygraphing for that uh, matter. Uh, so when we look at the nanomaterials, why we think that it's, uh, they occupy this uh, specific niche when it comes to their application. As I told you, single wall nanotubes are 100,000 times more than human hair. That means uh, 
even the single protein molecule, which has roughly the same diameter, will produce large change when it binds to the surface of nanotubes. So that's why we can make very sensitive sensors using carbon nanotubes. But at the same time, uh, people should be really concerned uh, if you have the materials that on the same size that the nanomachinery of the cells, then uh, frankly, we don't know what to expect from those materials. Are they gonna interfere or uh, are they gonna create some uh, negative effects inside the body? So th th that's uh, gave the, the, the start to the whole field of this uh, nanotoxicology where people really are uh, investigating the effects of the nanomaterials inside the human body. For sensors that I showed you so far, the, the nanotubes are just incorporated in the sensor chips and we're testing the, you know, either, uh, you know, na nasopharyngeal samples in case of the COVID-19 or breath samples for the GHC, or we can test also blood samples and so on. So we don't really worry about the nanotubes interacting with human body. But if you want to consider the nanotubes in vivo, then we need to really think about how we can design or understand the nanotubes when interacting with the body. And uh, uh, since the beginning uh, of the carbon nanotube field, people knew that you can actually cut carbon nanotubes to the smaller segments through oxidation with a strong uh, acids, uh, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, uh, uh, ozone, and uh, they can all oxidize and break carbon nanotubes to the smaller pieces. Bleach, uh, sodium hypochlorite can do so. But at the same time, people kind of assume that nanotubes must be per biopersistent under physiological conditions. And that's led us to uh, form the hypothesis that maybe if we, uh, you know, have the right enzymatic oxidation condition, we can also degrade nanotubes and viva. So that work was done uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Valerian Kagan uh, in the Department of uh, Occupational Health. Uh, we used the myeloperoxidase, MPO, and when it was mixed with the carbon nanotubes, you can see the nanotubes then uh, can be degraded, as you can see the disappearance of the presence of nanotubes in the solution. Uh, and the reason for that, that at the core of the uh, um, myeloperoxidase, you have this uh, protoporphyrin, this iron tree, which can then react with hydrogen peroxide to form this compound one, which is a really strong oxidative species that was known to oxidize many things. Uh, but if you have also chloride, as you can see here, then adding in addition to MPO and hydrogen peroxide, also sodium chloride, you have even uh, faster effect of the degradation of nanotubes. And that's because the chlorine, chloride can be oxidized uh, by compound one to form hypochlorous acid or bleach. And uh, basically that can really oxidize nanotubes quite nicely. Uh, so I told you the nanotubes have this uh, optical properties that allows us to look at the fluorescence. So my graduate student, Gordon, wanted to, to know if the uh, nanotubes are going to be degraded by this enzyme equally, or it will depend on their diameter. And working with the even mixtures of nanotubes using the fluorescent spectroscopy allows you to look at the, each of those uh, nanotube species individually. And uh, so he took this uh, carbon, single wall carbon nanotubes, which were functionalized by wrapping with sodium collate as a surfactant. And as you can see here, it's just only certain types of nanotubes, 6, 5, 7, 5, 7, 6, 8, 4, and 9, 4. And as you see at the beginning, 7, 6 was the highest in terms of the intensity, but through the uh, myeloperoxidase degradation, you can see it actually oxidizes much faster than smaller diameter 6, 5. So what we're finding that the larger diameters of nanotubes is actually can be oxidized faster than the smaller diameters. Uh, but, you basically can see that uh, using the uh, uh, carbon nanotubes as the way of the sensor for the activity of myeloperoxidase. So oxidation is myeloperoxidase will cause the decrease in the intensity of the, of the carbon nanotubes. And, and that's can be very useful for in vivo applications because you see uh, the excitation wavelengths and in the visible, but the emission in the infrared and as you know, the neon infrared uh, uh, light can penetrate deep into the tissue. So basically you can get that uh, 
uh, signals from deep inside the body so you can actually know uh, how the degradation proceeds. The only downside by using uh, this type of uh, decrease in the fluorescence as the way as a sensing uh, uh, is the fact that maybe you get the uh, decrease of the fluorescence not because of the MPO degradation, but maybe there is a, some other effects. Maybe you're not probing correctly. So ideally, you want the signal not just to decrease in fluorescence, but also the increase. If you can have the increase in fluorescence, that you can really truly make the in vivo sensor. And that was accomplished uh, uh, most recently by my graduate student, Xiao Yun to show that if you not just use single wall carbon tubes, which we know the fluorescence is going to decrease over the time as they're de being degraded by MPO, but if you use graphene oxide, uh, for some reason, what we observed that the uh, degradation of graphene oxide is actually causes the increase of the fluorescence. So we decided to, to make this truly ratiometric sensor uh, by making the nanoscrolls where the uh, graphene oxide sheets can be wrapped around in the nanoscrolls around this uh, single wall carbon nanotubes. And then when we're exposing it to MPO, uh, oxidation of single wall nanotubes will cause a decrease in fluorescence. And simultaneously, the graphene oxide, when it's being oxidized, is going to produce the increase in fluorescence. And this opposite response uh, in fluorescence can be used as the way for us to, to make this uh, ratiometric sensor. So the question that we ask ourselves, why the graphene oxide causes the, the, the fluorescence when it degrades? And one way to understand that, that the graphene oxide is not uniformly oxidized uh, with oxygen functionalities on the basal plane. There is a, some uh, uh, islands that are truly sp2 character, which potentially could be fluorescing, or as people call them graphene uh, uh, quantum dots. So they, they can have this known fluorescence, but this fluorescence are quenched because they now connected through all those uh, sp3 kind of uh, connections between those islands. And what we think is happening during the enzymatic degradation, those uh, oxidized the defected sites to kind of break apart and releasing those uh, sp2 domains that now free to fluoresce as the quantum dots. Uh, and uh, the most recently, uh, we investigated those degradation products and specifically observe this fluorescent graphene quantum dots that we are detecting using this uh, mass spectrometry uh, techniques. So uh, uh, Xiaoyun actually went through different uh, uh, species that can be isolated using chromatography and mass spectrometry. And then uh, we uh, try to come up with the chemical structures. And we also collaborated those results using DFT calculations and see if it can produce the right fluorescence that we're observing in our experiments. So basically we can tell that the, the products of the graphene oxide uh, uh, degrade, enzymatic degradation would be this uh, uh, small polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons with the oxygen functionalities uh, around them. Okay, and then the last part of the talk, uh, I want to show you uh, how we can use these carbon nanotubes for, uh, for drug delivery. So, so the idea is, okay, what we know that uh, carbon tubes can be potentially enzymatically degraded. So that means we can actually use them uh, for in vivo uh, delivery of the drugs and not to be worried of their any potential, uh, you know, by persistence. So that they're gonna stay there and produce some negative effects. We can actually be sure that the uh, eventually they're going to be degraded, but also we can use uh, the degradation as a principle of the releasing the cargo that we can put inside the carbon nanotubes and, uh, and release them through the enzymatic degradation. So if you want to make uh, containers out of the carbon nanotubes, we decided to use uh, this uh, multiple variety of nanotubes that has uh, larger the diameter and more space to fill with the potential uh, cargo, therapeutic cargo. Uh, and one way which we come up with doing that is to grow uh, this uh, multi-wall nitrogen doped carbon nanotubes using chemical vapor deposition uh, and uh, using a xylene as the carbon source and acetonitrile. But because the acetonitrile has nitrogen, the, some of the nitrogen is going to end up 
in the graphitic walls of the carbon nanotubes and going to produce this uh, uh, cone shaped structures. So basically, if you look at the transmission electron microscope on those tubes, they look like bamboo. So basically, they just made it of the segments. And those segments, uh, uh, my graduate student Young showed that can be separated uh, quite easily by just uh, sonicating. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a T prop sonicator, which uh, uh, can break mechanically those uh, stacked nanocaps into individual cups. And then uh, each of those cups then can be used as a drug delivery vehicle. So, uh, but truly, if you want to put some uh, drug inside the nanocup, you want to make sure that it actually stays inside and not being leaking uh, all over the body while it's being delivered to the target place. So in order to do that, uh, after this probe tip sonication to isolate individual cups, we use the same principle that I showed you with holographing when we're growing the gold nanoparticles at the openings, but now they're growing at the openings of the uh, nanotubes. And as you can see, it forms one continuous gold cork and basically effectively corks the content of the uh, inside of the nanotubes. So the, the gold nanoparticles are growing just by uh, first nucleating at the edges of the uh, nanotube, which we have a lot of uh, defect size and uh, nitrogen functional groups. And those, as the more and more gold nanoparticles uh, form there, they coalesce together to form one continuous quark. And uh, I told you we can degrade them and myeloperoxidase is this, especially in the presence of the chloride can produce hypochlorous acid, which can etch through the uh, graphitic carbon and break it apart. So you see after five days of the incubation of this nano cork nanocups with, the, uh, with myeloperoxidase, you see the, the, the quarks falling off of the nanocaps. You still see the nanocaps there, uh, but the gold nanoparticles are present there. And after 10 or 20 days, all the carbon is basically just unwraps and breaks apart into uh, smaller pieces, but gold nanoparticles remain, okay. <laughs> so the, nothing happens to the metal nanoparticles, but uh, <clears throat> carbon can be really degraded. And the uh, presence of gold nanoparticles allows us to use uh, principles of a uh, surface uh, enhanced Raman spectroscopy or SIRS to see when the gold is still attached to the carbon nanotubes and when it's being detached or when these uh, quarks being popped out of the uh, nanocups and the drugs potentially can be released. So you can see the, in the SIRS uh, the intensity of the peaks. And if you plot it versus time, you see it just uh, takes a few hours for the uh, MPO is oxidize the edges and let the cork to be released. And that's probably will release the drug. So most recently, my graduate student uh, says, uh, actually showed that uh, uh, he can put uh, uh, therapeutic agents such as paclitaxel. Uh, and that's the drug that being used uh, commonly in the treatment of cancer. Uh, but uh, the problem with paclitaxel it's very uh, toxic uh, chemical, and you need to needs to be released really in the tumor site, not everywhere in the body. So by putting this paclitaxel inside the nanocaps and corking with gold nanoparticles, we are uh, actually were able to show that when these uh, nanocaps are being injected inside the uh, uh, inside the mice with the tumor, uh, you can see that has the effect where the tumor is actually being decreased in the mice and 30% of the mice after the treatment were tumor free. Um, so just to conclude, uh, we can target special types of cells inside the tumor uh, sites that can uh, actually uh, release this myeloperoxidase and other enzymes that can oxidize nanotubes. And uh, <clears throat> the release of the drug has the benefit in terms of the uh, treatment of the tumor. Okay, so let me uh, thank, acknowledge all the graduate students and postdocs in my group who've done the work. Um, uh, and uh, all my collaborators from the University of Pittsburgh and other places. And the funding the, of the work that I showed you came from uh, National Institute of Health. Um, 
environmental health sciences, specifically for the uh, enzymatic degradation of nanotubes. NSF funded our work for developing of nanocaps, and more recently for the developing of this uh, holygraphene with metal nanoparticles. And we get also funding from University of Pittsburgh for the currently for the developing of this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, rapid uh, antigen test. And I thank you all for the uh, attention, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Pretty impressive talk, very amazing. I hope, by the way, that your uh, COVID detector will be installed soon, that we don't have to go through the sticking things in the nose all the time at, uh, <laughs> to, to travel. So questions? Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Oh, Sydney. Yes, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. For the last part with um, those uh, capsules, so you, the way you cork them uh, is because the gold nanoparticles are uh, sort of attracted to the defect sites around the lip of it. Do you, does that also happen sometimes with the drugs you try to put inside? Is there any limitation to the kinds of drugs you can load them with because they, rather than go in, would attach to the opening of it? Yeah, so, so far we, we show this with the uh, hydrophobic uh, drugs such as paclitaxel. So basically, uh, when we separate these nanocaps, we oxidize them with strong acids. So they basically, before they break apart into individual nanocaps, they heavily oxidize from outside. So they're really hydrophilic from outside and but remain still hydrophobic inside. So then when we mix it with hydrophobic drugs and water, uh, we actually add paclitaxel together with the somewhat alcohol and then alcohol evaporates and these lipophilic drugs have no place to go, but just being condensed inside, this, inside the nanocaps. So that's our trick to get them, force them inside, and then allows us to cork them afterwards. We haven't tried it with uh, more hydrophilic uh, uh, drugs, because you're right, if it's uh, more hydrophilic, then you just statistically trying to capture them. And then who knows how that's going to interfere with this uh, uh, growth of the metal nanoparticles. OK, thank you. Hey, Ari. Daniel, it's time, Weissman. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I have like several questions. Uh, one is like, how do you uh, put your carbon nanotubes in your sensors uh, with your gold electrodes? Is it from solution or do you grow it there? Or is there also an option to print them from solution? And then I will have another question. Okay, uh, yeah. So these days, uh, we used to grow them first on the silicon chips before we put the metal electrodes. But these days, we like to work with the semiconductor in each commercial nanotubes, which company is already separated. And having only semiconducting nanotubes has the big benefit in making good sensors. So we take these commercial nanotubes and we use dielectrophoresis. So we're applying electric field and that basically drives these semiconductor nanotubes between the gold fingers under the uh, electric field that we are applying. Uh, printing, it's an excellent question because, excellent because we already <laughs> considered that and not just considered, we ordered the materials printer that's supposed to arrive next week and then we will start uh, printing <laughs> carbon nanotubes. So, so, so you, you have a technology for dispersing single wall carbon nanotubes? Yeah, so single one on the chips that you buy, that, 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 uh, that's what I showed you. Uh, let me just go quickly. Yeah, so, so this commercial nanotube, you see it already comes as a suspension. So the nanotubes are suspended very well, in this case in toluene because of the polymer they use to wrap around them. Uh, so that's, that's a good ink for printing, but it's also good material that you can, you know, put as a solution and use the electrophoresis to basically assemble them between the fingers of the electrodes. But the functionalization they use to make them dispersible does not affect the electrical properties? Um, no, I mean, they, they just basically uh, separate them from the mixtures of the metallic and semiconducting. And uh, when you make the transistor, 
well, I don't have the comparison here, but I can tell you it's 99.9% .9 semiconducting. So you have really transistor crystalline where this, uh, it's uh, completely turning off. So, um, okay. so let me just show you the results. Yeah, so here's our COVID-19 results. So if you look at the transistors that we make from these nanotubes, you see you're applying the positive gate voltage and it's truly zero. So I, I can plot it on the log scale and you will see it's orders and orders of magnitude on of ratio, just truly semiconducting character of the nanotubes. Okay. okay. Other questions? So my next question okay. is, uh, you, you were uh, talking about the nanotoxicity and uh, uh, you said that the enzymes can uh, degrade single walls, but you also showed some structures that uh, looks like multi-walls. And although it's like considered that multi-wall carbon nanotubes are toxic and single walls are not toxic, but what you show here, it's maybe something different. Well, we, we used nitrogen doped uh, multi-wall nanotubes. So we intentionally created uh, a lot of defects into multi-wall nanotubes to make them degradable. If you took just multiple nanotubes, all carbon, uh, I didn't show that, but we published on that uh, previously, uh, what you can accomplish in enzymatic degradation, it's only the outside layers of the uh, multiple nanotubes, the ones that potentially have defects and being oxidized. But once you peel off those outside layers and reveal the uh, pristine un unoxidized uh, layers of the inside or walls inside the multiple carbon nanotubes, well, there's no degradation, degradation stops. So you need to have the defects in the nanotubes in order to, to get that uh, degradation going. That's why graphene oxide degrades so well. And this nitrogen doped carbon nanotubes that we synthesize in our lab, because of those defects, nitrogen defects, uh, they degrade well. So we intentionally created type of the multiple nanotubes that, uh, for the drug delivery. Other questions? Thank you. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I like the ingenuity of using something that many of us look at not uh, positively and use it in a positive way, notably the bamboo types nanotubes. Usually bamboo types is kind of, oh, it didn't work out this well, so well this time, right? In the synthesis and you get the bamboo nanotubes and you are able to, to make a lemonade out of a lemon, so to speak. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, I want to thank one more time the speaker, Professor Starr. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Very interesting. And I really hope that some of those things, especially the SARS, goes really in operation soon. Uh, and at least that frees us from so this kind of uh, torturing thing that they do here. And uh, thanks to everybody. Just to remind you on the IVS side, we are preparing in two weeks. On July 15, we have the student conference organized by students for students, but everybody is free to attend. It's free, it's online. And uh, we have already confirmed speakers, uh, Professor Sir Richard Friend and also Professor Yuri Gogotsi. Uh, so it will be a very exciting, and plus there's Intel there, there's other, other surprises. So keep tuned, July 15. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for participating in this. Thanks to Professor Starr. Uh, the series, Imer Sashem, will restart after the summer. So thank you to everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you.